Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to what is day five of uh, reInvent. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Harshal Pimpalkote. I'm a senior manager product with the Amazon Bedrock. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been an uh, amazing reInvent. A lot of stuff going on with uh, generative AI and with Amazon Bedrock. Uh, quite a few announcements. Uh, we're going to cover uh, guardrails on Bedrock in this session. But uh, before we jump into the topic, I just wanted to uh, give you a quick recap of uh, all, all the different things that, that we have uh, recently announced and how Guardrails uh, sits in the context of, uh, of what is evolving as, as the entire architecture. Uh, we'll, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of the session. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll be around here on, on, the, on the floor uh, taking questions. Uh, we have quite a few things to get through, so, so let's uh, jump into it. Uh, joining me today is uh, Anubhav Mishra. Uh, he's uh, a lead on the product side for uh, guardrails. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll cover the guardrails piece first, uh, talk about uh, agents and, and how guardrails applies to agents uh, in, in, in a bit. Uh, but overall, uh, to, to, to talk about uh, bedrock and, and about guardrails, uh, as you may have seen in the keynote, uh, we really want to provide, with Bedrock, we, want, we really want to provide you with a choice and flexibility of models. Uh, we, we have models from third-party model providers as well as uh, Amazon, Amazon's own Titan models. Uh, and and with, the, uh, with these models, we want to help you select the right, right model for your use case. Uh, it's not a straightforward uh, a uh, straightforward thing to do, and, and which is why we wanted to provide you with evaluation on, uh, on Bedrock. So, so that's, that's one uh, piece that we launched in preview earlier this week. Uh, in addition, uh, we want to give you uh, tools to customize these models, and customization is possible through a couple of ways. Uh, one is through uh, fine-tuning and continued pre-training, uh, which uh, we made available in preview uh, earlier this week and also through Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. And, and we have a new API to simplify the RAG capability on Bedrock. And, and finally, with agents, uh, that's the integration uh, layer where you can integrate these uh, models into your applications. And agents uh, help you uh, automate uh, uh, multi-step tasks. So, so that's, that's agents on Bedrock. And as you look at these three layers, right, the, the, the choice of models, the customization, and the integration, uh, all of this r really requires uh, a strong security and strong privacy uh, to make these enterprise ready for your mission critical workloads. And, and which is where Guardrails comes into picture, right? So Guardrails provides you the ability to uh, steer these interactions between the foundation model and, and the user, uh, uh, customized to your company policies, customized to your uh, uh, content or content filtering techniques, right? So, so that's, that's where Guardrail sits, in, if, if you want to uh, think of the overall architecture. Um, and that's what, that's what we're going to focus on. Uh, really quick on the agenda, we have uh, a deep dive into Guardrails that Anubhav is going to lead. Uh, we'll do uh, a couple of demos. I'm going to talk about agents and how guardrails can be applied to agents as well. And, and then we'll close it out with Q&A. Yep. All right. Anubhav. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you, everyone, here. So we'll quickly get started with the use cases that we see on generative AI. So typically, generative AI has the power to transform uh, many industries. What we have seen is they are able to power use cases that weren't really possible before using the standard automation approaches. It has significant potential to boost employee productivity, enhance customer experience, and optimize business processes. Let's start with the most basic use case, chatbots. With a quick show of hands, how many of you have used or built generative AI chatbots so far? Quite a few, love the excitement here. So in general, like we have another common use case that Herschel was referring to, RAG, which is a retrieval augmented generation around document search, document summarization, or questions and answers. Beyond that, there is numerous use cases around code generation, process automation, uh, contact center agent assistance, and so on. So how do you go about powering these use cases, and what are the different challenges that we face with these use cases? 
While the foundation model powering these use cases are incredibly powerful, they can uh, answer many questions, they can automate many tasks, but they also generate, creating these generative AI applications also comes with a huge number of challenges. So some of the challenges that we're listing here and that we're going to touch upon in de uh, deeper details are, as an application developer, when you build a generative AI application, you need to ensure that your uh, application is on topic. You need to ensure that you're preventing undesirable and irrelevant topic, and your application is aligned with your organization policies. For example, let's say as a developer, if you're building like a, a online banking assistant, you want to ensure that it does not provide investment advice to your users because it will put them at financial risk. A second challenge is basically around toxicity and bias. Every time a user interaction happens with any customer-facing chatbot or any customer-facing agent in this case, you need to ensure that those interactions are uh, not harmful, not toxic, and all of these malicious inputs gets either filtered out or are, uh, or are removed and are uh, provided back with like pre-configured, organization-approved responses. So one of the uh, major things in the generative AI space is we need to ensure as application developers that any of this harmful or toxic content are, not, uh, are completely removed from those interactions. The third use case or the third challenge that you typically face is there are certain use cases where you have to process PIA data, sensitive information, and there are going to be use cases where you do not want to process it. So uh, you need to have the required safety systems in place where either you are completely able to reject the inputs that contain, contains PIA or privacy-related information. On the other hand, if you have scenarios or use cases, let's say a contact center with an uh, agent and a human interaction, where you capture a lot of user information and you're using generative AI for summarization of those conversation transcript, you need to ensure that those personally identifiable information is redacted. So in order to protect user privacy and uh, uh, stay compliant to your organizational policies. And finally, as a developer, you need to promote fairness in all of these interactions. Generative AI brings in those new set of challenges as well, and you need to avoid any toxicity or bias in those scenarios. So what happens is many of the foundation models that are available on Amazon Bedrock already have a lot of these protections in place. So for example, if you provide a, uh, uh, if users interact providing a malicious input or a malicious prompt or engage in any activity or any interaction about fraudulent activities, most of these models are designed in a way that they provide an appropriate and safe response. And model providers use a variety of techniques, including training, fine tuning, to uh, ensure that these kind of safe responses are basically provided as part of uh, such malicious inputs that the user might try to provide. But all of these, uh, all, yeah. Yeah. all of these protections that we have are basically model specific. And in order to develop a generative AI application, you may need more customizations on top of what you already have. As discussed, you may want to avoid undesirable topics in your application. You may want to uh, ensure that your organizational safety and privacy policies are adhered to by building these kind of applications. And on top of it, finally, you might be using multiple foundation models for different use cases and different scenarios. You also need to ensure that there's a consistent level of safeguards available across any foundation model that you use. And that remains one of the foundational challenges of using a variety of foundation models here. So what we have done here is we, uh, in order to mitigate these challenges, we are excited to launch guardrails for Amazon Bedrock in preview this week. Uh, what we did as part of designing guardrails is we spoke to customers that are building use cases around both internal as well as external scenarios. Internal use cases spans across employee assistance. External scenarios spans across uh, uh, customer-facing chatbots. We spoke with customers belonging to different domains and verticals, including regulated industry. What we wanted to understand was, what does Guardrail really mean for them? What are the safeguards that they need? And how is this going to help their use cases? And to, uh, in order to meet all of those requirements, we launched Guardrails that basically implement safeguards that are customized to your specific use cases and that can align with your company's responsible AI policies. And guardrails provide an, a range of uh, policies and controls we'll, which we'll get into in a bit. So how does guardrails work? Guardrails work by intercepting both the input prompts that you provide to the foundation model, as well as the responses that are generated by the foundation model. 
And those are vetted against the policies that are defined within a guardrail. Each guardrail contains four different policies that spans across uh, denied topics, content filters, PI reduction and word filters. PI reduction and word filters will be coming soon. Uh, every time there's a user input, what the guardrail does is it will evaluate the user input against all of these policies configured, vet it out, see if all of these policies pass. And similarly, the uh, FM generated or the model generated output will also be simultaneously vetted against all of these policies. If there is a policy violation, the response of the model gets overridden by a pre-configured approved response based on your use case or your organizational policy so that you are able to provide a more safe and appropriate response to the end users here. Now let's dive a bit deeper into the individual policies that are supported inside the guardrail. The first one is denied topics. So as discussed before, we took the banking example where if you're building a banking assistant, you do not want the assistant to talk about investment advice. So you'd want to create a policy that does not talk about investment advice and you'd want to define that topic. So in this case, what the application developer could do is they can simply create a custom topic named as investment advice. Defining this topic is very easy. You provide a name, you provide a natural language description of the topic. As you can see, the definition of what the investment advice is is basically defined in the topic. This allows guardrails to understand if the inputs or the outputs belong to that specific topic. And in addition to that, you can also optionally provide few example phrases. And these example phrases need to be representative of how the user inputs are going to look like versus how the model generated responses are going to look like. Once you're done, denied topics is over and you can configure multiple denied topics within a guardrail. The next one is content filters. This essentially targets uh, toxicity and harmfulness. Content filters comes with four different granular categories of configuration that you can provide. That includes hate, insults, sexual and violence. In addition to that, you also have configurable thresholds so that you can adjust the degree of filtering. The higher the degree of filtering, the more stricter the filtering gets and the more aggressive it becomes, the lesser the likelihood of seeing harmful content here. High, as you see in the screenshot, is the highest degree of filtering here. And again, you have configurable levers both for user input and FM generated responses in this case uh, that you can individually fine tune. The next one that will be coming soon are word filters. Now, what are word filters? Word filters are nothing but a list of custom words that you can define. These could be anything like competitor's name that you do not want your application to engage in, or this could be anything that is inappropriate in the context of your specific application. So you could define a set of words, and then there is an additional level of handling that you could do. You could either block inputs that contain those specific words, or you could block the uh, foundation model generated responses that contains those words, or you could even mask those words in the response generated, depending on what use case suits your specific scenario. Uh, in addition to word filters, uh, we also have a list of predefined set of profanity filters that is available. So you can just turn, turn it on and basically all of the profane words that might appear either in user input uh, be, gets blocked or could get reducted. The next one that we look into is PI reduction. And this is very, very important for privacy protection of your users. As I was referring, if there is a use case around an application, let's say a general customer facing chatbot, which does not really just provides information based on, let's say, uh, pre-configured documents, and it does not really need to have any PII data. In order to stay compliant, you can configure a select set of PIIs that you would want to block in your user input. So the way it's going to work is, once the input is detected to contain a specific PII, those user inputs get blocked, and the approved message that is already configured in the guardrails Get, uh, it gets sent back to the user. Another use case would be around the contact center that we just spoke before. Let's say your application is designed to handle PIIs. You need to handle those PIIs. You need to respond back to the user. But uh, while storing all of that information, let's say you're creating summaries out of a contact center transcript. While storing that information, you need to remove those in order to stay compliant and in, for record keeping. So what you could do here is you could also configure these guardrails to redact this PII information as part of the model-generated responses, so that that elevates the concern of privacy protection of users here. Uh, it will come configured with a list of PIIs when we launch it, and you can select which PII you want to redact depending on whatever the use case or whatever your application is going to look like. So now let's get to the demo. 
So first we'll go through uh, the steps of creating a guardrail, then we'll talk about how do you go about testing a specific guardrail, and then we'll talk about how do you monitor and analyze whatever the guardrails uh, has flagged as violated content. So in the Bedrock console, you can, if you're starting off new, you can create on Get Started. In the left panel, as you see, there will be a guardrails preview. Uh, once you're in that, you can select Create Guardrail. As you see here, you can provide the name of the guardrail. Uh, one of the cool features about guardrail is you can configure multiple guardrails in your uh, Bedrock account. And what that means is if you have like 10 different applications which requires different kind of configurations, different topics to be avoided, different uh, toxicity filters that we were talking about, you could have different configuration and during the inference call, you can select or during an application configuration, you can select which guardrail to pass on to. So it's very, very flexible right now and you can completely fine tune it based on your use case. So we create a guardrail here. You provide a simple name and an optional description of what the guardrail does. We will go ahead and create a banking assistant guardrail here. In addition to that, you can also configure KMS keys for encryption of the guardrail configuration that you have. You can also tag it. And these are standard AWS constructs that you get with any resource. Now in the denied topics, first we go about defining an investment advice topic. You do not want to provide investment advice to the end users. As discussed, uh, you select the name of the topic and then you define the topic. The definition basically refers to uh, inquiries or guidance or recommendation around the management or allocation of funds. That's how you define investment advice. We'll not add any example phrases, it's optional. We add a second denied topic here, and this is going to be related to financial crimes, let's say. You do not want your application to engage with users anything on any information related to financial crimes. Uh, we complete the denied topic step. Next up, what you get is you need to configure the content filters or the toxicity filters that we had. You can select these filters. You can configure any of these uh, capabilities here. So one of the things to keep in mind here is guardrails is an independent safeguard agnostic of the foundation model. So any foundation model protections that you have, that continues to stay intact. These configurations will apply on top of the user input and the foundation model generated responses. So as you increase the filter strength, uh, basically every utterance or every input that the uh, uh, input prompt that Bedrock gets, Guardrail basically assigns a confidence classification to each of those inputs. And depending on the confidence classification, the filter strength operates on filtering those out. So if you have, let's say, configured the filter strength to high, all of the, uh, all the inputs that are classified or all the outputs that are classified with any degree of confidence classification being falling into these four categories will get filtered. So we are just looking at the configurations and what are the descriptions of these sections here. And once you configure the filter strength for the prompts, you can go ahead and do the same for the responses as well. We click Next. And this is the part where you configure the approved messaging from your organization. So you see there are two different messages. You can configure a separate granular message for when the user input is in violation of the guardrails configured policy, and you can configure a separate message when the foundation model response is in violation of the guardrail policy. So we configure two separate messages here, and this ends up creating the guardrail. So this is a final page where you could review the guardrail, and you finally go and create the guardrail here. So as you can see, the guardrail is created. We have one guardrail that's got created. Now the next step is once you have created this guardrail prior to deploying in production or in deploying in real world workloads, you would want to test this guardrail out. Now guardrails comes with a native capability of testing it out. And because it's foundation model agnostic, you can actually select specific foundation model during the testing process. And we'll see how it works right now. So we go to the guardrail. On the right panel, you see there is a test window. Uh, you see that there's a select model. So we are going to select a specific model there. So this is a standard model selector console that you get for all the model models that are hosted on Bedrock. You get the option to pick and choose any uh, large language model that we have on Bedrock. Right now, guardrails are available on all the large language models for text based inputs. So you can select any model that you would want to test with. 
So for this, we are going to select Amazon Titan text. And first, let's try with a simple use case that you've created a banking assistant guardrail. You would want to ensure that it's working for both uh, non-harmful as well as denied topics. So we ask a simple question on what are, what are the ways to apply for a credit card in this case, or how can I apply for a credit card? This should not trigger any guardrail, so you uh, hit on run. And what we'll see here is there is a model response that gets generated. There is a final response that's also there. And as you can see, both of them are identical, in which case guardrail did not override this response. At the complete bottom, you see that there is a status check called passed, which means that guardrail did not flag anything in this scenario. Uh, let's try another uh, response which does not really trigger a guardrail with a different model provider, uh, just to show how it works with all of these models here. What are the steps to open a checking account? That's another example which should not be passed. Now, this also did not get flagged. You see that both the responses are the same. Now, let's get to the scenarios where we are actually asking about stuff that we have defined in our denied topics. Let's first talk about investment advice in this case. Can I get guaranteed returns if I invest in stocks? As you can see here, there is a model response which is coming directly from the model. It provides an appropriate response, but you want to go ahead with a configured the response within your guardrail based on your organizationally approved verbiage. So guardrail has overwritten that response, and the final response now is whatever we had configured just before. So if you expand on the test console here, you can also see the details of exactly what was flagged within the guardrail. As in this case, you can see denied topics, got detected, the investment advice topic was flagged, content filters was passed because there was nothing demeaning or toxic in this uh, question. Now let's ask another question, and I, uh, we add another flavor and add like a slightly toxic comment, you're stupid. So can I invest in bonds and golds? If you cannot answer it, you're stupid. Let's see how the evaluation works. In this case, again, the model responded with something appropriate. Guardrails came up with an approved verbiage. If you look at the right panel on the guardrail trace, both the denied topic as well as the content filters got flagged. Content filters got flagged with insults with a confidence score of high. And denied topics actually flagged the investment advice piece. So all of these policies work simultaneously on the input and will provide you like a detailed trace of what's going on with guardrails. Now let's look at an example of uh, how the financial, financial crime related topic works here. And this an interesting example. So we'll start with a non-harmful example first. We select a model. We start with a non-harmful example around, can I get access to my account? Like, doesn't look like anything harmful, right? You're just asking for steps how you want to access your account. So we should expect that guardrail should not be flagging it. And as you expect, the model response, final response is the same. It's passed for both the scenarios. I just tweaked this input and just changed one word. Can I get access to someone's account? Now, this is falling in the range of financial crime territory. And this is what a guardrail should be flagging. As you can see, there is a model response. And then there's a final response which got overridden because financial crime topic got flagged in this case. So this is how you go about testing the guardrail. Once you have defined all of these configurations in the guardrail, you basically go about testing it. The next step prior to deployment is you need to create a version of your guardrail, and that version becomes an immutable point-in-time snapshot of whatever your working draft currently was. So we hit on create version. We uh, give a description of the version. And once you have created a version, it's basically ready to deploy in production. Every time you uh, create an inference call, you can then pass the guardrail ID, and then you can pass the version number, and accordingly, that specific version of the guardrail gets triggered. Now, next step is once you deploy these guardrails in production, what's next? How do you go about monitoring how users are using it? How do you go about uh, ensuring that you are able to uh, take corrective actions for repeat offenders who are basically violating any of these usage policies? And that's where what we have done is we have integrated, Bedrock already has an integration of CloudWatch logging. What we have also done is if you have enabled those logs in your AWS account, the whole guardrail trace payload will also be part of the logs. And we can see how that works. So we go to settings. Uh, we already have a pre-configured logs being enabled here. And then there is a CloudWatch logs called banking assistant logs that is configured. 
Uh, now we go to the CloudWatch console where all of these logs are getting delivered. And we'll look at the examples that we just tried right now. So you go to logs. Logs group is where you find that CloudWatch logging. You see the banking assistant logs in this case. And we go to a log stream. So here you see we tried with various examples right now, and all of those are listed here in the logs based on the timestamps whenever it happened. We're going to dive deeper into two of them. The first one is how can I apply or what are the steps to apply for a credit card? Right? The, if you look at the logs here, you have the user input, how can I apply for a credit card here? And then you have the complete model-related responses here that you see. And this is a guardrail trace that you basically get access to. So everything that guardrail did or everything that guardrail did not do, all of those logs are basically uh, logged here so that you can create analytics dashboard out of these logs by consuming it into QuickSight or any other uh, analytics tool that you might have. So these gives you like topics that were detected and the uh, content filtering tags. And there is a final guardrail check where in the console it basically said it passed. In this case, it's basically guardrail did not intervene in any capacity. Now let's take a look at the second one where it actually did end up violating the guardrail. So it's the same thing. So you have the input uh, that was provided. You have the output that, are, that got overridden by the guardrail. You also have access to the actual output that the model generated so that you can basically observe what came out and what did get violated. You get access to what was the topics that were violated here. And then you get a detailed list of which specific content filter policy got violated. As we add word filters and PI reduction into this, all of those logs will also be visible uh, as, as part of this. So this is how we go about uh, creating, testing, and uh, monitoring and analyzing a guardrail. Next, we are going to talk about how do we deploy this in an application. And this is where agents for Amazon Bedrock come into play. And uh, Harshal will take over for agents. Thank you, Anubhav. Uh, so we, we covered quite a bit in, in terms of configuration on guardrails uh, and, and how you create these, uh, how do you monitor these in, in CloudWatch logs, and uh, all, all the good stuff there. Uh, what we're going to do in the next few minutes is we're going to talk about agents and uh, how do you apply guardrails on agents. Uh, before I go forward, uh, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you are familiar with agents on Bedrock? All right, very, very few. So, so let, let me do this, right? Uh, let me give you a quick uh, overview of agents, and uh, then we will talk about uh, all, all the stuff that Anubhav has, has shared. How does that apply to uh, agents uh, on Bedrock? Uh, so with, with agents on Bedrock, uh, can I get the clicker, please? Thanks. So, so with, with agents on Bedrock, uh, you, you have uh, a, a capability that uh, you can use to automate uh, multi-step tasks. And, and the way we do it is using uh, chain of thought prompting, and I'll get into some level of detail in, a, in, in just a bit, but we, you, we use chain of thought prompting to orchestrate uh, the user request and then uh, invoke the APIs or look up information uh, to actually complete that task. So uh, the goal really here, as, as I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, if, I, if I can remind you, there's, there's, the, there's the models, there's the customization, and then there's integration, right? Uh, and you, as you integrate with applications, uh, you, you uh, use uh, agents uh, to automate these tasks. So um, uh, it's really straightforward. You uh, create an agent, and we'll, we'll walk through a demo today. Uh, on how to create an agent, uh, you add what are called action groups. And I think of action groups as, as a set of APIs that you can uh, use to uh, you know, uh, in, in, invoke actions to in your, uh, or, or get information from your uh, company systems. You add data sources so you can look up information securely. And then you uh, are ready with the agent and you can interact with the agent. That's, that's really, pretty much it, right? Um, if I were to take an example, uh, think of uh, an insurance company and uh, they want to automate their claims processing, uh, you can uh, create an agent to, uh, to do just that, which is uh, take a request from the end user and uh, look up a list of all the open claims 
uh, figure out uh, what each uh, claim has as pending paperwork and maybe send a reminder. So, so what you see, uh, what you see at the bottom here, uh, you, you provide an instruction that you're an office assistant uh, to help manage insurance claims. So, so that's, that's the developer provided instruction. And then you provide it with a set of APIs uh, which is really three over here. You get a list of open claims and uh, compile the docs that are, uh, that are pending and then send a reminder. And then adding the data sources, maybe you want to answer questions as, as you go through this interaction. Maybe users want to know, hey, uh, what, are, what, are the, what is the complete list of uh, uh, documents that, that you need to process a claim? And uh, finally, you have uh, the interaction uh, through a single API. So, so that's, that's really at a high level how agent works. Uh, jumping a level deeper, the agent, think of agent as, as a container. Uh, you provide it with an instruction, which is what uh, was referred to as, an, as in the first step in the previous slide. And the agent contains the action groups. So it has the API schema, and we'll, we'll look at the API schema just in a bit. It has the Lambda uh, functions or the reference to the Lambda functions. So you can uh, invoke the APIs through the Lambda function. And uh, the Lambda function itself has, let's say, up to three APIs, uh, API 1, 2, and 3. This is the claims API. Uh, get the pending docs and then send reminders. So those are the three APIs that would sit over here. So this is the agent, uh, uh, and it encompasses the action groups and, and reference to Lambda function. What sits outside of it is the data sources. So, so these are the uh, knowledge bases. Uh, and, and you provide the, the location, uh, the source type, and the credentials. And then we'll look at creation of, of a, a knowledge base as well, or, or a data source. So, so that's, that's the overall structure as, uh, as you set up the agent. Now, uh, you want to apply a guardrail on top of it. Let's, let's take an, take, uh, build on the example that uh, Anubhav shared, right? You create a uh, banking guardrail. And in, in my case, my application happens to be related to the insurance domain. Uh, I shouldn't be providing financial advice. I have created an agent to process insurance claims. That's, that's what it should focus on. And even if the user tries to uh, you know, ask for, hey, what, what kind of stock should I invest in? It should come back with a polite answer. Sorry, I can't help you with it. So this is based on my company policies. I've decided that I'm going to engage in only insurance claims related uh, uh, conversations, right? So guardrails can be applied to the entire agent. And, and if you look at it from, uh, from an architecture point of view, uh, you, you still have your agent, you, you define it as, as you do with the action groups, reference to the Lambda functions, and the data sources uh, referred to as well. But then you have a guardrail that encompasses the entire agent. So, so that's... Uh, uh, and, and, and you can apply multiple guardrails to, to a single agent. So, so that's how we are thinking about it uh, uh, in, in the context of agents plus guardrails. All right, so a few, few screenshots before we uh, jump into the actual demo where you'll see this in action. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an agent. It has an action group. It has, uh, it has a knowledge base. And uh, if you see the third uh, container here, uh, roughly in the center of the screen, you'll see the guardrail uh, detail, right? So, so, so this is a guardrail that I applied, and uh, there's, there's some uh, prompt editor or advanced prompts, as we call it. But if you, if you glance to the right side of the screen here, right, um, I, uh, there's, a, there's a question uh, uh, about, uh, you know, tell me about banking, right? And uh, it, it realizes that it's not, not, a, not something that it should engage in. Uh, the guardrail kicks in, and uh, you respond, or the agent responds with, uh, sorry, uh, I won't be, or in, in this case, it's, it's just a quick uh, block tier uh, response, right? Uh, in, in terms of uh, the guardrail itself, uh, it's, it's a uh, guardrail that uh, was described earlier. I uh, walked you through uh, quite a bit of detail, but uh, you can go into the agent and you can select uh, the guardrail here from a drop-down screen. And, then, and we'll, we'll look at it in the demo just in a bit. Uh, the, the guardrail itself, uh, I, I just have a test guardrail over here. 
uh, just just to show you uh, where it sits inside uh, inside of guardrails itself. Uh, that's that's pretty much it on on this one. Uh, let's do the demo now, and 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 I'm sure you're going to have questions. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, we're going to take all the questions towards the end of the session, um, and uh, we'll we'll go through each one of them. So uh, let's uh, let's play the demo, please. And I'll, I'll talk along as, as we go through this. So, so first what we're going to do is we're going to create an agent. Uh, this is uh, on the Bedrock console. You go to the, click on Create Agent, and you provide uh, agent details. So I'm going to provide a name. I, this happens. Uh, this is the insurance claims agent uh, that I was referring to. So you provide the insurance uh, claims agent. You provide it with a quick description. Uh, this, this, this description is, is just for admin purposes. This is not the natural language, uh, uh, natural, natural language instruction that we were talking about earlier. But you provide uh, the description. Uh, there is a few uh, uh, standard uh, configurations related to permissions uh, that you have. Uh, uh, you may have a, a KMS key that you want to use. Um, so, so you could select that. Uh, you select the idle session timeout, uh, you know, the, the time that the agent should be, uh, I, can be idle for, and then you go to the next screen. And, and th this is where uh, you have quite a few things going on. So if you can, if you can quickly pause on the screen, um, you select the model of, uh, for, for the agent. This is the model that is used to uh, convert the natural language instruction that you provide to a chain of thought prompt. The, this is really the crux of it. Uh, we've spent quite some time uh, figuring out uh, what is the, the best, the most optimized uh, uh, prompt for for an orchestration uh, uh, for, for an orchestration function. So, so so I selected the model and the version, and uh, then I uh, provide it with an instruction. So here you say you're an agent, uh, you uh, work on insurance claims, and uh, uh, provide uh, provide. Uh, help with uh, pending paperwork and, and send reminders. So, so this, is, this is the instruction that I was referring to. Now this is key. This is where you, uh, you provide um, as descriptive as necessary what you want the agent to do, uh, and, and we'll use this to convert to the prompt. So, so that's, that's the uh, uh, instruction. And, and, uh, and on the next step, uh, here's where you apply the guardrails. So this is new. Uh, the agents part was available previously, but here's where you apply the guardrail. And I'm going to select the banking guardrail that, uh, that Anubhav uh, talked about earlier. Uh, the guardrail, uh, it has a name. You can, you can edit it. And uh, you'll see, uh, let's, let's pause here for a second. So, so here's, here's where you add uh, your uh, utterances, the denied topic list. So you're an insurance agent. You shouldn't be engaging in uh, any, fan any kind of financial advice. So if someone asks uh, you, um, you know, what, what kind of stocks should I invest in, or how do I balance my portfolio, or anything related to your 401k, these are the utterances that you would use to, uh, to tell the agent to, to, to steer the conversation away from, uh, from, from, from these topics. Right? So, so once you've created the uh, guardrail, uh, you can uh, you know, evaluate your, uh, your utterances. Uh, you can add uh, quite a few. I can't recall uh, the, the, the limit, but there's quite a few utterances you can add. You can add multiple guardrails. Uh, but in this case, I'm just uh, going to add one. Click on Next. Uh, add a few action groups. So action groups, as I described earlier, this is what helps you actually invoke APIs. And uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, so uh, I, I have three APIs, really, that I want to cover in this action group. Uh, like I described, one is a claims API to get a list of all the claims. Uh, the second one is a, um, a pending paperwork uh, API. And the third one is going to be a send reminder. So, so that's what you see uh, in the schema over here, right? Uh, so just a quick note about uh, the API schema. Uh, you, you provide, you, you, we, we use uh, a schema format 
uh, so that you can provide the name, description, the input, and the output of, of these APIs. And, and, and the description is key over here, because if, if you notice, uh, the description is, is around the first uh, one, one third of the screen, and, and it, it tells you that this is an API that will get you the list of all insurance claims uh, uh, and, and, and for the policy holders, right? So uh, just a quick call out that uh, for every API that you define in, in your action group, uh, these, uh, th th these API descriptions are gonna be key because the agent is gonna be looking for these descriptions to figure out which API to call when. So, so that's a description, let's, uh, let's continue. And then uh, that's the claims API. Uh, we, we talked about uh, you know the, the summary. The, the summary is like what, what all you're going to get uh, back from it. Uh, there's a second API. This is uh, related to the paperwork, and then uh, there's going to be a third API down below. So, so that's uh, uh, that's the API schema. I just wanted to you know quickly uh, walk uh, walk you through what uh, what the schema refers to, and and then uh, as next steps we'll go back. Uh, we will uh, we will use. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the open API schema, uh, it's open source. And, and then uh, we uh, go back to the um, agent and continue with, uh, with the next step. So uh, we provide, uh, the, the API schema lives in S3, so we provide it with a link to the S3 and uh, then hit next, right? So, so that's the uh, action groups. A quick overview of the Lambda function that the action group refers to. Uh, again, to, uh, uh, if, if you uh, recall for a, from, a, from a few minutes ago, each action group refers to a Lambda function, and the Lambda function is the one that uh, contains the actual API definitions, the API 1, API 2, API 3. Uh, you could define the entire API in there, or you could have the API point to one of your uh, you know, backend systems. But, uh, but this is uh, the code for, for uh, in, in the actual API for the pending claims and um, a few other items. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really the Lambda code that we're looking at at this point. So once, uh, once the Lambda code is uh, uh, written, you, you, st you store it in the function, uh, you apply it uh, or you reference it in your action group and uh, now uh, this is just the selection of, th of the Lambda function here uh, that we defined and you click on next. There is a knowledge base, it's optional. You can add knowledge bases, uh, like I described earlier, to uh, answer any questions uh, that, that the user may have. And then you pretty much uh, are, uh, are done creating the agent and applying the guardrail. So, so that's, uh, that's the final screen. You do a, a final review and, and hit create, and the agent is created, right? So, so, the, so what, we, what we just did is, is the agent creation piece. Similar to guardrails, you can apply, uh, uh, create a snapshot in a, in, at a point in time uh, to create a version. To deploy it, you can uh, create an alias, um, and, and then you're ready to interact, right? So uh, for the purposes of today's demo, we are, we're just gonna interact with it directly in the test console. So this is a console that's available in, in Bedrock, and um, uh, we, we interact with it with, with a question, uh, you know, tell me, first, first it's a benign question, uh, tell me a list of, or give me a list of all open claims. So it, it thinks for a while and comes back with, with uh, a response. Uh, while, while we wait for that, a quick note, what you see on the right hand side is the chain of thought trace. Uh, so you can see uh, all, all the uh, uh, items that are happening under the hood. Uh, and, and then it will go away and come back with a response. I see there's a question in the, in the back of the room. Uh, if, you can, if you don't mind just holding on just, just a couple of minutes and, and we're gonna open it up for questions. Yeah, thank you. So, so it came back with a, uh, with a response and uh, you see that it has claim one, two, three and claim 06, right? So two claim IDs uh, it came back with, it called the claims API and um, those are the two claims that it received. Right, uh, the chain of thought trace is something that we launched as well earlier this week. It provides visibility. It's, it's a great, great tool for you to actually figure out what's happening under the hood. Right, so so that's that's a standard uh, interaction. The guardrail wasn't kicked. It, kicked. it did not kick in. 
uh, everything went fine. Now let's continue uh, to see, uh, to ask it a question which should trigger the guardrail, right? So uh, we, we asked something related to 401k. Hey, uh, hey, can you tell me about my 401k benefits, right? Uh, it's going to think for a while and, and come back uh, with, with the guardrail kicking in, right? So that's, that's what you're going to see uh, just in a bit. Quick note while, while we uh, wait for that. Uh, the, the chain of thought trace that you see here uh, provides you with the visibility. Uh, we launched it earlier this week, and uh, we also provide the prompt editor, so you can refine your prompts. Uh, and and, we, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to you after, right after the session about how to manage the prompt editor. But, uh, but, the, but the response came back in, and in this case, the guardrail kicked in, and uh, it said uh, something like, sorry, I'm not able to respond. Uh, just, just for the purposes of this uh, discussion, I've, I've kept it as, uh, uh, you know, called out that the guardrail was kicked in. So, so that's, uh, that's the demo that we had for agents plus uh, guardrails. Um, in, in closing, uh, do we have another slide here? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in closing, uh, what, what I can share with you is, uh, is how the agent's workflow now changes with, with guardrails in picture. So if you recall this slide from, from a few minutes ago, you create an agent, you add action groups, knowledge bases, and, and you interact with the agent. The new step in here is you apply the guardrails. And, the, and this, uh, this, this uh, holds true for both the creation of the agent and interaction of the agent. So, yeah, so that's the guardrails on agents piece. Uh, and uh, with that, we are at the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we'll be around here for uh, Q&A. Thank you.